Hi, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. In this video, I'm going to conclude my section on grounded theory. Um, I've uh, discussed grounded theory in two parts. In the first part, we looked at basically what grounded theory is. Uh, I talked very briefly about open coding, uh, axial coding. Um, I talked about the, the way in which grounded theory um, is discovered is the technical term, is discovered from the data, right? So with that, we discover the theory from the data. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to complete the discussion of grounded theory, uh, and then we only have two more to discuss, which would be ethnography and case studies. So we're almost done with our introduction to the six various methods of qualitative research, um, and now we will conclude uh, the section on grounded theory. With that, it will be a uh, section, my discussion comes from section 4.2, in your notes. Uh, if you want to follow along, just click the banner that will pop up over the video. It'll take you to the PDF or click the link in the description box. It'll also take you to the PDF and um, follow along. Alright, so let's begin. So this is an introduction This is section 4.2. This is section 4.2 in the notes. Again, um, this is an uh, analysis of grounded theory. All right, what I've uh, what I've been doing, in, and I just want to make sure that I have. Hold on a second. This is 11. I need 10. Oh, I need my notes. Just so I know where I am. That. I got a little. Okay, so key elements. Okay. All right, so this is the. Um, we're continuing the discussion of the key elements, right? And you can follow along. Um, we're actually on number nine now. Uh, the, the first key element, not the first, but the ninth key element that we're going to discuss, this is a continuation from uh, section 4.1. Uh, I broke it up into sort of uh, distinct parts because it's just too much information to cover in one series. Um, usually I want to limit the series to no more than an hour and a half, um, and this is, this is this was well beyond it. Um, I'm not even sure how many, but probably like six or eight hours in as far as lecture on uh, qualitative methods research. So it's, you know, I find it's better to sort of segment it than to have one massive, one massive uh, amount of, you know, information that you have to watch. All right, so number nine as a key method, these are the um, core phenomena codes. Core right, the core codes, the core phenomena. Um, this is an isolated category selected to further develop the theory. Right? An isolated category um, selected to further develop the theory. Remember what we said in the last video series. We have categories and as a subset or as an aspect of categories we have properties. And then as an aspect of properties we have dimension. The example that was given was the example of color. So that color can be classified as a category. And a property of color is shade and a subset or a dimension of shade is the gradation of shade from lighter shades to darker shades. So that we can see that category is a more general, a more inclusive concept um, or collection of cons concepts, consolidation of concepts. And pri um, properties and dementia are aspects or characteristics of the category. When we're talking about um, isolating a category to further develop the theory, we, re we recognize that in open coding, right, in open coding, we are going to label our categories. So this is our category, the application of a label, roughly speaking, the application of a label to multiple concepts, since we recognize that categories are composed of multiple concepts. We recognize that this whole process is open coding. Then we recognize that sort of the relationship between um, 
multiple categories. This category is similar to this category for this particular reason. This is roughly an aspect of axial coding. But what we can do at this point uh, as one of the core phenomena, as one of the core codes, is to select an isolated category um, to further develop. So in our research, for whatever the, the, the purpose might be, if we select the um, category of, I don't know, let's say domestic, domestic uh, abuse as an essential category, um, we might develop, further refine the development of that category in the application um, uh, of the analysis to the development of some theory. Because as we know, what's going to end up happening is that from the data that we get, right, from the coding that we get, we're going to be able to derive the theory, right? We want to derive that theory. So the theory is only um, ever relevant after we've gone through our process of identifying concepts, our process of open coding and labeling, our process of axial coding and comparative, contrastive uh, sort of application of uh, um, relationships between categories, right? It's through all of this that we begin to see the emerging theory. Um, after which time we can we can identify our theory as being grounded in the data, and it, you know, hence the term. Um, so number. So hopefully that's that's pretty clear. So when we're talking about core phenomena or codes, what we're saying in the discussion of core phenomena or codes is that um, a category is going to be selected for um, further development. Number ten, uh, causal conditions. Causal conditions. Causal conditions are factors that cause or influence the phenomena, and these are known as the antecedent um, conditions. These conditions cause um, the phenomena. They're known as antecedent conditions. Um, basically, in logic, this is a conditional statement. I'm not going to get too much into this because it's not a, a logic lecture. But the antecedents You have the antecedents and then the consequence, right? If this happens, then this happens. Right? If, and actually I shouldn't put, I should put it like this, right? If, if this happens, then some other state of affairs happens, right? If, then. So the antecedent is our causal condition. These are the things that um, factor into or serve as a causal factor for the consequences that we're analyzing, right? So it's sort of, we're retracing our step backwards. And this is very, very sort of like intro-friendly intro -friendly, uh, analysis into uh, conditionals. You can watch my videos on uh, Symbolic Logic. I think it's Symbolic Logic 1 to have a further discussion of sort of conditional claims. But remember what we said, um, and not even we said, what uh, uh, Strauss and Corbin say is that anytime we're talking about grounded theory, we're going to know that our, grounded, our theory is grounded when there's an interplay, right, where there's an interplay between the propositions, what's being proposed, and the sort of process of checking or verifying those propositions against the data. So that we have our data here, we have our theory here, and this would be our, what's being proposed, our propositions, and this would be sort of the validation or checking Right? So we have a propositions that we are able to make, what's being proposed, and obviously what's being proposed is this theory. The good thing to recognize is that antecedents factor well into propositional claims, right? If it's the case that uh, this happens, dot, 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 then it will be the case that this happens, dot, 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 dot. This does happen, therefore this will happen. Um, when we're talking about um, the technical term antecedent conditions, obviously these antecedent conditions are going to affect the, the, the consequences. So, uh, as far as causal conditions, it's, it's relatively uh, straightforward, right? Causal conditions are antecedent conditions. What does it mean to say that a causal condition is an antecedent condition? It's just saying that the antecedent condition or the causal condition affects, influences the consequence that follow necessarily from uh, its existence. It's being the causal condition.